Good to have you all back to ThinkTechWise Human Humane Architecture and our 210th show. And we're back with not us three from the filling station yet, but the three from the beach, I guess we can say. We're broadcasting live from the west coast of the mainland of the United States of America with hospitality design legend Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello. And we have our co-host, uh, fellow host, DeSoto Brown, Bishop Museum historian here, up the foothills of Diamond Head. And we have me, Martin Despang, back a little further down these foothills. And I'm broadcasting live from the bathroom of the Grand Hotel in Waikiki. <laughs> uh, not confined anymore. I'm out of my quarantine that we addressed last time. So getting out more and makes us think more about where are we going? And, and currently we're uh, in uh, surging cases of COVID. So the governor has just issued new mandates that we can do less outside. And we're all afraid we're going back to what actually you only witnessed as the only one of us, DeSoto, when we closed down everything. And with that, we also closed down our main revenue of tax money, which comes from tourism. So we think we urgently have to reinvent ourselves as far as that and many other things. But, um, you know, informed uh, citizens we are, we don't want to reinvent the wheel when there was already a wheel that, that, that was running pretty well. So we're looking at one of the finest examples of tropical brutalist uh, hospitality design again, which is the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel uh, on the Big Island. And let's bring the first slide up because we're still close to the end of our investigating um, exercise of thinking why did Lawrence S. Rockefeller design the firm of SOM to commission the building? And uh, DeSoto, uh, we had been running across another uh, SOM building a while ago. And that one we see here, share with us which one that is. Is this the engineering building? Is that correct? Yeah, am I, am I remembering that yeah, right? That's Holmes well, Hall, is, the engineering building. We were just thinking that um, this has similarities to the Mount Kea Beach Hotel. And pardon me, there is a airplane flying over me right at this very moment as I'm trying to speak. Um, did you point Illustrating the importance of tourism, yes. Sure. <laughs> this building has some similarities to the Mount Kea Beach Hotel in that it is long, low, and horizontal but it's perforated with uh, a lot of open space, including a long skinny courtyard right in the center. And when we were first talking about this, whenever that was, uh, you were saying that you'd been told that there was, there were rumors that they were thinking of roofing over the courtyard and enclosing it so that they had more space for the building interior, which is a terrible idea because it's a terrible idea. Yeah, and talking good old days and you know, how great uh, was it of my employer, the University of Hawaii, Manoa, to have witnessed and seen one of the greatest pieces of architecture going up on a neighboring island and saying, we want to snap that architect too and have him design something cool as well, literally and figuratively speaking. And there is Holmes Hall. And please, yes, do not enclose the courtyards. Don't do that. And, and th this is still part of the bigger picture, looking beyond our horizon. And so this is part of a series that looks into the, you know, if tourists have the choice to go through all the hassles that I had to go through, through quarantining, although I was fully vaccinated and PCR tested, and going to what the Flux magazine, uh, which I was talking about and when Jay had me in Global Connections a couple of days ago, we have, and uh, this is how we concluded the fourth episode of basically the European Hawaii versus the Polynesian Hawaii, right? Which is Madeira. So at some point where it's so much pain in the butt to come here, you know, people are gonna say, well, no, you know, if there's something that's pretty close to it, we do that. And obviously we do not want that. So we have to really get creative. And, and that's um, again, what this show is about. But we want to look at the best practices from the past. So here, we're still at the end of our investigation. We're pretty close to that we think we figured out why Rockefeller went for SOM. So I brought my little uh, Sears tower here, and now Willie's tower, my Lego one. And I say hi to Suzanne's youngest, uh, Yoni, who is a Lego expert. And he's currently 
in what, by the way, governs uh, Madeira, which is Portugal. So, so hi, Yoni, fellow Lego uh, enthusiast. So Sears Tower and Holmes Hall are both from the 70s. Uh, they don't qualify as precedents uh, that made Rockefeller basically go for SOM. So let's go earlier in times. Uh, next uh, slide which is uh, uh, following uh, Jay's order of uh, copyright violation prevention. We are digging out all the old goodies from the past that we took ourselves. And the top left is from when I moved from the prairie to the desert with my town car and a U-Haul trailer in the back. And I knocked on the gate of the Air Force Academy and the guard was you know, enjoying listening to my crazy story, but then still wanted to take a look into my trailer and then was fine and let me let me in and i took a picture of what we see here and that is uh walter netch uh young designer at som at that time who designed his masterpiece of the cadet chapel and that one we could say well might have been a precedent because it looks like what guys well, it looks like an a-frame uh kind of like an a-frame and an a-frame is a traditional uh, form that's used in a number of different cultures, but that includes traditional Hawaiian culture, partly because it's so easy to do, and it's a very rudimentary type of structure, but it was also very, it was repopularized during this time period because it looked very dramatic and it looked very space age as well as being traditional. Exactly. But in these days, luckily, we weren't postmodern yet. That come, it came, unfortunately, next and we think we're still in it although it dresses differently but so that wasn't the reason either uh so we have to go further back and the one at the bottom left is probably what really perfectly manifests the beginning of uh of som's work which is the 50s by natalie de Blois, one of the first uh you know female architects to come to fame together with the legendary gordon bunsheft and that's the lever house but when we go to the very right, we might have caught SOM now, because this is the one Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City from 61, so early, you know, enough years before uh, the Mauna Kea. And there was a consortium of clients behind it, but a major one was, guess who? Lawrence S. Rockefeller. So he probably must have been already comfortable with his architect uh, and didn't go for, which we pointed out, who would have probably been qualified more precedent-wise because he had just built one of the best, utmost, easy breezy, tropical exotic pieces of architecture around the same time, who was Warnicke, who built the state capital. But this is most likely the reason. We can't prove it. We just put this out for speculation, but that's as far as we can think of, right? And let's go to the next slide and, and have Ron introduce to us what we see here. But I, we want to introduce, you know, we are so familiar with each other by now, but we just want to remind the audience. And, and this is uh, my day, my weekly uh, German word lesson uh, for you guys. Do you recall what I taught you? And can you say it with a sharp S? OK, yes. I do it once for you and repeat. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. Zeit Zeuge. Zeit Zeuge. Yeah, and, what is, and, and that's what you are, Ron. You are a Zeitzeuge and a Zeitgeist, a Times witness, because the, the guy who was became the, the lead designer for this project was not Gordon Bunshift. It was not Natalie Lebois. It was not Fazlur Khan. It was not Walter Netsch. Who was it who is a peer of yours, Ron? Yeah, yeah the, the designer was Charles Bassett, who was a fairly... Uh, young architect who uh, eventually took over SOM's office in San Francisco. And uh, I've always dreamt that maybe Charles himself might have drawn this wonderful section. And we should look at that section drawing uh, closely because we're seeing easy breezy resort architecture in some respects for almost the very first time in a building that is anything, I mean, it is modern. To, to an extreme, it's a modern building. But the incredible sensitivity of the designers to bring the outdoors in, to create courtyard spaces that both ventilated uh, across from Mauka to Mackay, but upwards to, 
through openings to the sky. Uh, uh, the experience of going to your guest room in the Mauna Kea Hotel was wonderful. You were in a garden with water coursing through it, palm trees high enough to be sticking up above the roof, and a beautiful natural ventilation. In fact, the architects had intended that that ventilation in this hot, dry site on the Kohala coast on the Big Island, uh, that they wouldn't really need air conditioning. If you open that door to your room and you had your sliding door open, you could take advantage of what the architects were trying to do for you. But of course, when you advertise a hotel uh, to people back in New York or Stuttgart or wherever, they expect to see air conditioning somewhere mentioned. Yeah, and, and DeSoto, you wanted to point an, an anomaly uh, as well, uh, which breaks with a traditional way of uh, approaching hotels, right? Yeah, well, we're seeing a cross section of the hotel, and we are seeing what is the, as, as Ron just said, the central courtyard with full size trees in it. But this is on a sloping site, so the slope goes from the left down to the right. And when you enter, you come in actually on the second level. Now that's breaking a lot of traditions because everything up until then, you come into a lobby that's on the ground floor. And this was breaking that tradition. What also you can see here, and we're gonna talk about it more, on the right side, you've got uh, columns that are on the ocean side. When you're in that space, you're in a two-story, hardly open space, but with these massive columns that we're going to see later on that are adding to the whole grandeur of where you are. And this was an area where uh, lunch was served, I think breakfast as well. So you actually sat in those places and, and sort of absorbed the whole feeling while you were looking out onto the vista of the bay on which this hotel is situated. Yeah, and we will see all that in the following in the shows. And just analyzing what you just said, uh, the sort of breaking with a sort of um, Victorian tradition of hotels that we were just at the, um, you know, virtually, of course, not physically, but physically next at the Moana Surf Rider, which has a lot of goodies from your per personal collection up on the wall as, as much as from your employer. And that's an example of turn of the century colonialism, right? It has the big port cocher as the porticus that impresses you. And then it actually gets less exciting the more you go inside. But with the modernism that, Ron, you guys embody so well, and the case study houses, which is the beginning of Ed's career, right? It's like almost like, where is the door? Where is the facade? This is just the wall, right? And once you uh, basically pass through that threshold, it all opens up and it wows you, right? So it's like the, it's, it's the reverse of the, of the old sort of imported invasive colonial. And that's, that's rather impressive. I would say, again, uh, the coach in me, I would say, hey, uh, emerging generation, go back to a hand drawing because we want to remind the audience, computers, as you said, the Soto, they were at IBM and in big corporate offices, these super big monstrous machines, but they didn't have any graphic abilities at that time. So this was all hand drawn. And as you were speculating, you know, Ron, that your, that your colleague Charles did this basically by himself, I would say what, what blows me away from this drawing is that it's basically the, the presence of nature and what nature does and how nature, you know, protects us as, as vegetation, you know, keeps us cool and shaded. So the architecture does. And you almost see no architecture. It's like the presence of nature and the absence of architecture, which you couldn't get it better tropical, exotic, easy breezy, as, as you said that. So um, with that, let's go to the next slide and look how that then became reality. And you guys ex explain. I have to say, shame on me. I don't even qualify for this show because I never, I have never seen it. I yet have to see it. So what am I doing here? I rely on you guys. But you also said it's been a while. I think you both separate from each other. The last time you saw it was in the 90s something. But we have, um, you know, there's hope uh, from all the documentation. We know it hasn't changed much, and we will talk about that more. But share with us your memories and impressions and your feelings uh, from when you were witnessing these situations. Well, the thing that even as a kid, because the first time I saw this, I was 11 years old. 
the thing that I found intriguing is that the, so many levels are, are in view when you walk into it. Wherever you are, you can look around in this open courtyard and see the different levels of the building. And it's intriguing. And you kind of want to walk over to, to look more at what you're seeing. But also, the thing that you can see in the picture on the left is the tiled floors. And this is really distinctive. When you walk in and then you're in this lobby level, which is on the second level of the hotel, the, the floor underneath is blue tile. And as Ron said before we were doing the show, it gives you a sense of coolness, which is very appreciated because likely when you arrive, it's going to be hot because that is a hot, dry location. And yet there's air movement. And when you walk inside, there is green vegetation, all of which is very inviting and pleasing to be in, in this otherwise hot, dry location. Ron, so for, this, for this particular building, said very specifically that a strong uh, connection to natural landscape was the primary aim in their designing this, this hotel. And uh, that, in my experience, was that, yes, uh, I could uh, sense that myself just by walking through it. Uh, these uh, garden spaces that we're seeing in these photographs, they're protected from the heat of the sun. There was a wonderful diffuse light, uh, partly because it was coming from overhead and from the sides. And then that wonderful natural ventilation. What maybe doesn't is not all that clear is that you're also you were in a framework uh, that surround that that surrounded the nature. And as you look through the framework and through the the uh, uh, the palm trees and the tropical landscaping, you could then look out and through all of that man-made and landscaping. And what was out there? The Pacific Ocean, the glorious Mauna Kea Beach. Uh, and that wonderful surf flapping there all the time. It, it was, you were indoors and outdoors at the same time in one of the most uh, successful examples of doing that. Yeah, and different to these days, right, where it's all about the bling and the masquerade and the decoration, there is no such thing, right? This is really reduced to the max, to the elements of circulation. And there is almost the absence of detailing here. Everything is kept really, really simple, right? And that's you know almost in, 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 in exact contradiction to today where you say the more the better, the more you throw at it, the more makeup you put on, the more you impress. And here it's really kind of the, you know, I always, Ron, you tell me, but I always thought that while, you know, um, uh, the great I am pay, which by the way, there's a lot of, you know, connotations and, and references, right, guys? The, has brought the, the Lucan sort of philosophy to the masses. And in the My Architect movie, you know, when Nathaniel, um, you know, Lou's son asked I am Pei about that, Pei confirms that, right? And, and so I always thought, you know, what, what I am Pei was for Khan is what uh, basically um, SOM has been for me. And we get to the cruciform uh, columns, which he did very early in the Tugendhat house, uh, you know, as we remember from architectural hi history, if, if we paid attention, we would just want to refresh our memories. So in some ways, I think, you know, SOM was basically sort of mass popularizing the, the Misian agenda. And in both cases, you know, Khan had only built, you know, two handfuls of projects. And so Basically, you know, uh, it's it's the same with with Mies, right? And and these these American masters basically brought it brought it to the mass. And obviously, Mies's agenda was just that, you know, doing the most with the least, right? You know, the other thing I wanted to add is that you can see in the picture on the left, the stripped down interior is a setting for these amazing pieces of art that Lawrence Rockefeller purchased or commissioned that are displayed throughout the public spaces of this hotel that in many cases are these amazing antiques or um, ethnic carvings, et cetera. So the interior of the hotel is not full of bling. It's not full of, of you know, cake decorations. It's a space where you can look and appreciate you, at these, these amazing pieces, which are part of the entire Mauna Kea Beach Hotel experience. Yeah, and I suppose if I had one uh, comment about those courtyards, 
I've always, I always loved to see vines draping down and softening concrete. I think there could have been more of that uh, that would have added uh, greatly to the sense of the tropics. Everything basically there is growing out of the ground level uh, and next to pools of moving water at, uh, at the level that, that you walked in on. Uh, yeah, this, this green thumb architect would love to have seen some of that cascading and even colorful vines uh, softening the concrete even more. Well, I think we, we can say, you know, he, he left this to the Killingsworth Lindgren uh, Stricker Wilson team to do that. But as we see at the very end of probably a, another volume, at least, um, basically you taught uh, uh, Mr. Bessett that, which we will see at, at another project, Ron. So let's go to the next slide because this section, as you guys said, is where the courtyards are. But we have the other sectional uh, situation uh, basically in, in this sort of transfers uh, section here, which is where uh, the, the hallways are. And, and this is almost like within a ziggurat or a pyramid where the floors are tapering up and they keep this sort of slice of, uh, as Lu Khan was always saying, what, what slice of light does your building have, right? This is the slice of sky that SOM and Bessett's uh, SOM uh, basically here provided. And, and this, is, this is really uh, also getting closer to, to actually, uh, while the whole thing is, is stereotomic, which we will talk about later and more, but, but there is a tectonical notion to it that. So th this actually looks more killingsworthy to me, I have to say, than, um, than, than other parts. And, and you guys just share, again, your, your firsthand and own experiences of, of having been in these spaces, please. Well, the thing that strikes me that's really quite wonderful is, like I said earlier, I like to see, I like to be in places where I want to walk further. I want to see more because there are vistas that I think I can go look at. The fact that they're the connecting walkways between the two sides of the building are staggered, so they're not they're not evenly uh, spaced above each other. And also I love these kind of skeletal floating staircases where the individual steps are just sort of attached to one diagonal member, but you can see the sort of function of what there, what there is there. And I also love that it's contrasted with the water and the vegetation so that you've got the concrete along with plants, along with water. So it isn't just all concrete in the setting. Plus, you've got the sky up above you, and you've got all of the Pacific, as Ron said, off to the side that you can look at. Yep. All right. I, I have to remember that uh, the Kahala Hilton, my, my boss's sort of uh, most magisterial hotel, I think, and what uh, put us on the map as far as hotel and resort designers, actually opened about uh, a year and a half uh, before the uh, Mauna Kea, and I hadn't, uh, so that meant that I didn't get a chance to see the, you know, the Mauna Kea until really quite some years later after the, the Kahala had finally uh, broken through to the public and, be, and had become successful. But I was just, again, as I said before, blown away by how they created this frame filled with nature. Uh, and as uh, DeSoto touched on, very cleverly, every now and then, an axis, you'd see something off in the distance, you had to go to it, and it might be a 12th century Buddha over five feet tall that they imported and put at the top of a, a stairway to nowhere, uh, which was just gorgeous and unexpected. And uh, you can tell that this is right up there with my favorite hotels in the world. You're not alone with that. I mean, above and beyond the three of us, and we will talk about that later. But talking the surrounding, let's go to the next slide, which is probably the last slide we're getting to the end of the show. But it really truly illustrates here uh, how basically vacated, you know, dry, as you guys pointed out, this part of the big island here is. There is at the very bottom, uh, uh, De Soto, uh, an, another building that looks like a, you know, like a checkerboard pattern. And, and this is interesting. Tell us quickly, you said it's a private residence and by whom it, it translates, it relates to hospitality um, pioneering as well, DeSoto. Yeah, so at the very bottom of the picture in the lower left is a home that is right on the coast. 
It doesn't look like a home because it's a big complex, but actually it was a private home built for and owned by Lurleen Roth. And she was the daughter of Captain Matson, who had started the Matson Navigation Company, which today is the major carrier, the, mostly the sole carrier of cargo between to, comes to the Hawaiian Islands, but had been the major carrier of passengers to the Hawaiian Islands throughout the 20th century on these very palatial ships. So she was very well to do. She was able to afford this magnificent modern home and she was able to build it when the Mauna Kea Hotel was under construction because mm -hmm. that the road that was built for the hotel allowed access to this site, which she was able to use for her own personal getaway on the Big Island. She parasited, so to speak. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And but but the actual Mauna Kea, you can see down there. It's almost like it fell from the from the sky, like this meteorite. Right there is this big mass. It's a chunk, yet it's perforated. It's aerated. Right. It's like cheesecake, Swiss cheesecake. So that, that's a rather. We will talk more about that in the in the probably two more volumes here. That it's a very sort of ambiguous kind of creature. That is many thing in one. And, and Ron, what did you want to add to that part? I was going to say that the black and white photograph we're looking at also indicates just how remote uh, the hotel was from everywhere. Now, uh, Rockefeller obviously was a very canny businessman, one of the most successful and, and thoughtful uh, urbanists and, and love of art and, uh, and a love of hotels. But there had to be a tremendous amount of money spent not probably by necessarily just Rockefeller, but by the state of Hawaii to get utilities to this site. I mean, you've got to have sewer, you've got to have water, you've got to have power. Now you've got who knows what else you have to have to operate something that remote. And that commitment and that money commitment by the state or whomever uh, in, in, in alliance with Lawrence, with uh, Rockefeller, put that hotel in this wonderfully remote place, which in turn put it on the map as one of the, the first destination modern resorts in the tropics in the entire world. Absolutely. And that's a great closing note, Ron. Um, we are at the end of our 28 minutes, obviously, uh, hopefully gotten you hungry for more. So we will pick up from there next week. And until then, please stay safe. And that way, also, as we are in the tropics, we have the advantage over the temperate climates uh, to stay easy breezy, tropical exotic, you know, uh, keep distancing and cover your mouth whenever you go cl too close to other ones. But otherwise, take advantage of our unique selling proposition of the breeze. So uh, stay easy breezy, tropical exotic. And Martin, please keep honeymooning. I will now, now that I'm out of captivated, you know, captured inside in my Grand Hotel, we will live it up as you recommend it. And, you know, uh, on that note, what, what Suzanne is most excited about to go to a place that has some good local organic food, we figured out it always comes down to the goodies on full circle to the Killingsworth Lindgren Stricker Wilson because it's the heavenly in the plinth of the, what used to be the seaside hotel and got rebranded as the shoreline. So there we go. We've got a, even a little culinary restaurant recommendation for you. So, <laughs> all righty. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.